This is the first uh, academic seminar this year for HQSD Institute for Mar Emerging Market Studies. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Margaret uh, Morifazio, who I've known for many years. Uh, she is the Betty Duran Str Stangle. Stangle, Professor of Applied Economics at Bates College, formerly Associate Dean, I learned recently, of, uh, of the college, and a Research Fellow of the Institute of, for the Study of Labor, IZA. We just had a conference where I saw Maggie last week for IZA in Beijing. Uh, her PhD is from the University of Pittsburgh, She's on the editorial boards of Journal of Contemporary China, Eurasian Geography and Economics, and on the advisory board of the Chinese Women Economists uh, Network. And I won't read much of this, just to say that uh, uh, Maggie has done a lot of very important work on uh, economics of gender, especially in China, but also on issues related to uh, the exper different experiences of minority groups in the labor market. And recently, she's been doing a lot of really fascinating work on um, discrimination as it shows up in job ads and, and uh, interviews for jobs through uh, internet job boards. So we're going to hear about this research today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really happy to uh, talk about these studies today. Uh, two of them are actually have been published already, although one of the published ones I've never presented. It went right, right from written form into publication without me actually stopping at a conference or along the way. So this will actually be the first time one of these studies has uh, had the, uh, the opportunity to get some feedback. Um, so I typically, um, in the past, have worked a lot with Chinese survey data and Chinese census data. This um, sort of foray into doing these three resume audit studies is quite a change from what I normally do, and I have to say it's something that I have really enjoyed doing. Um, so I started on my last sabbatical, which was 2008, 2009. Um, I learned about resume audit studies for the first time, and I also learned uh, how important the internet job boards were becoming in China. And um, I actually didn't have the programming capabilities um, to go around and sort of scrape the, the um, job boards for information about job ads like uh, Kai Ling Shen and, and Peter Kuhn had done. And so I thought, what could I do? And I realized, well, I can see how firms are responding to these various um, applications that people are sending in in response to the ads. And I began to think about this, having just learned about these types of field experiments. Um, so I ended up working with my undergraduate students at uh, Bates College. I had a number of students who were from China. So we ended up sort of designing the experiments and then they ended up going home on their summer vacations uh, and working on these projects. So they were um, under, they had fellowships that supported them financially and then we worked together very closely. Uh, and so over the course of the three, I had four different, uh, three experiments, I had four different uh, research assistants, some of to, some of whom worked on two, and some of whom I'm uh, sort of co-authoring the results with. Um, so they were just great, uh, great students to work with. We had some wonderful students at the college. So today I'm going to talk first about the ethnic, um, the resume audit study that looks about how firms respond to individuals who are applying, who have virtually the same type of resume, but whose ethnicity is indicated by their names. So we chose uh, ethnic groups whose names were very clearly not Han names. So I'll talk about that one first. Um, I'll talk a little bit, actually I put them up in the reverse order, but I'll talk a little bit about the very first resume out study, which was on how marital status and employment status could affect job candidates' chances to get a call back for an interview. And then lastly, I'm going to put up a few slides about the facial attractiveness and gender. And um, so I'll talk. At the beginning, I'll say a few things about resume audit studies, which are general to all three studies, uh, and the methodology. And then after that, I will just talk about them as they differ, perhaps, from the, the general format that I'm going to, uh, to, to discuss. So first of all, exactly what is a resume audit study? Um, it is a study in which you send out fictitious resumes. So essentially you're creating people on paper, but you're sending them in response to very real job ads that firms are posting. Um, and they, what this allows the researcher to do is to create resumes that differ only in terms of the 
characteristics under study. So, and it also allows the researcher to see exactly what um, a, uh, an employer will see. So it kind of levels the playing field for the researcher. They can see exactly, they have access to all the information that a firm would have to, would have access to. Um, and typically, people measure discrimination as the difference in the rate of callbacks. Now, some economists argue with this and say, well, perhaps firms are not really discriminating or they're using a kind of discrimination that we refer to as statistical discrimination because groups may differ in their sort of average characteristics or the variance of those characteristics. And the firms aren't really discriminating, although they're changing, they have different rates of callback. So I deal with some of these uh, issues in the design of the experiments. But generally, in the literature that's being published, people have just said, you know, if one person belonging to a particular group gets 50% more callbacks than another group, you can look at the rate of discrimination by simply looking at those differences. Um, for people doing these, the, the advantages of the resume audit studies is that you have, a, you know, the benefits of, um, and a controlled experiment that is set in a very realistic setting because these are real job ads posted on job boards over which the experimenter has no control. Um, and it allows in some sense, I think a uh, pretty good sense in most cases, uh, an identification of a causal effect. Um, it basically, in one, two of the other advantages are um, that you can really generate contemporary data at a very low cost compared to doing a survey. So it really has a really good advantage in that sense. Um, and also, as I said already, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty easy, uh, not a lot of technical skills. As long as you can use an internet job board, uh, as long as you can set up an Excel sh a spreadsheet and you can count, you can do one of these. Um, so let me get into a specific study. This is the first one um, that I like to discuss. It's actually the second one I carried out. And this is uh, about ethnic discrimination. Um, I had a question about the methodology. It seems hard to ever be able to rule out unobserved heterogeneities because, of course, you can control for all the content on the, on the resumes, but if the employer is associating, it's kind of this statistical discrimination argument, obviously, that if the, if the employer is associating a certain ethnicity with a bunch of unobserved traits, Right. Not, then you don't know whether the response is because of the ethnicity or because of the other traits. Right. So that, that was Heckman's criticism. Um, so you can certainly observe the difference in callbacks, but you can't necessarily attribute all of it to discrimination. So that was his criticism of audit studies in general. And, and Neumark's response to it was, if you control for other productive characteristics, you can eliminate some of that. And so, um, so two of the studies that I do, we actually put in variations in other productive characteristics. The third one is facial attractiveness. Um, I think we actually can really identify causal effects there. Um, and I'll explain why when we get there. Uh, and that one, we actually don't vary the productive characteristics. So we're not actually paying attention in some sense to Heckman's criticism and Neumark's response. But I think we actually have done a pretty good job on the design. So when we get to that one, we'll sort of come back to this. Can I also ask a sort of methodological question, which is there are some famous resume audit studies that were done in the US and in France. Did you have to vary your methodology from theirs appreciably because it was in a Chinese setting? Um, more because it was uh, completely on the internet job boards than it was because of the Chinese setting. So, so the famous one by Bertrand and Mel Melanathan um, used new responses to newspaper ads to a, a large extent. And so, um, and also, it, in some ways, it's easier in China with the internet job because everything is done digitally. Um, so yeah, there's been slight differences in the methodology, but not, uh, not that much in terms of the design of the resumes or how you respond, you know, how you respond to the job ads. But it, it's actually simpler, I think, to do it in China in many ways. Um, Yes, um, and I'll uh, I'll explain that in most of the um, 
most of the experiments that we did, um, in the first couple of experiments I did, both of, my re most, both of my research assistants were female, and because they were going to actually be answering callbacks, we held gender constant. So we just uh, applied as if we were, as the case may be, 24-year-old university-educated women. So what we were varying in the first one was marital status and unemployment status, but everything else was held constant. And in the second one with uh, the ethnic minority, again, it was all female applicants. So, and again, so that sort of held constant differences in stereotype threat by male or female. Um, and uh, so, but which resume got a Uyghur name or a Han name or a Mongolian name or a Tibetan name was done randomly. And also when we varied productive characteristics, that was done randomly. And which order we applied in was done randomly. You know, so which, uh, which of the resumes went in for each candidate and which name was on, it was all applied randomly. Uh, but we only, only varied um, certain characteristics. So in the, on, on ethnicity, mainly the only variation uh, was you know, we made the resumes and then we randomly applied the names. And then we randomly applied which of the resumes. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, one, of the th one of the things uh, about the internet job boards, you know, I, I think most people in the room are probably aware of the sort of, these sort of general characteristics um, about China's population, about 8.5% as ethnic minority. There's lots of different recognized minorities, some, many of whom actually dwell in autonomous regions. Um, some of them are in you know, a lot of politically sensitive border areas. And one of the things that is important is that people are identified by their Shen Fan Zhen, their ID card, and it states on it what, uh, what their ethnicity is. Now, when you apply on the internet job boards, there are prescribed um, categories of, of information that you have to uh, fill out when you're filling an application. You are not required to put your ethnicity on an inter internet job board application. So that's why we use names as indicators and we only picked a few of the minorities whose names were very obviously not Han. That is the only reason we only use the, the particular minorities that we did, is that the, the application process did not require something just like the, the Shenzhen Zhen does. Um, so there are specific laws that are employment related uh, that are supposed to protect uh, minorities from discrimination. And I've put two of these articles here, one from the China labor law and one from the law on promotion of employment. And workers are, you know, are not supposed to be discriminated on the basis of their ethnic background. Um, there's been a lot of literature on, uh, by economists on ethnic minority populations and their well-being. Um, some of these papers have addressed urban income, rural poverty, occupational attainment, labor force participation, and so on. And generally, these papers tended to find that ethnic minorities were not faring particularly well uh, in, the, in China's transition to a market economy. Um, and so then the question is, well, why not? Is it simply because they're being discriminated against, or is it because they are really different characteristics? You know, so basically, are there, are there characteristics that are endowment of their human capital? Is it different, or is it that they're treated differently? So to get at that, a lot of these uh, papers that I just cited, and these are the ones that came out before this paper was written. Um, there have been more recent ones, including some of my own. Um, but the, the limitations, so what people would do is they would try to decompose the differences in outcomes, whether it was occupational attainment or if it was pay, try and decompose it into its components to figure out you know, how much of the differences in whatever the particular outcome under study is could be explained by differences in productive characteristics that the individual had, and how much was it because they were um, how much was left unexplained? And often that unexplained residual, what you couldn't explain by product productivity differences, was attributed to discrimination. But in fact, um, there, you, know, you don't know if the model was misspecified, things were left out, you know, there are things that were unobservable. So what the resume audit study does is basically allow a much more direct approach. Um, we could try to measure the direct uh, amount of discrimination by simply controlling the, uh, the features that are on uh, the resumes in terms of their productivity. 
Okay, so how important are the job boards? Uh, in 2011, this is a, some statistics we gathered as we just began this study on ethnicity. And we could see that the job boards were used very intensively. So, you know, you're looking at sort of daily, uh, you know, maybe three, three month averages of the daily page views of over 60 million. And, and this is just citing information for the top three job boards at the time. And there are lots and lots of sort of uh, provincial or, you know, smaller or citywide job boards. But looking at three of the national job boards, these were in, um, you know, they were, they were used pretty extensively. All right, so of the, um, you know, by 2012, there is some information that almost uh, slightly more than a quarter of the new graduates were finding their, uh, their first jobs through internet job boards. Um, and so, they, so basically, you know, this, and I, I just have to believe, I haven't seen anything more recent than this statistic on 2012, but I have to believe that that's just grown exponentially even in the last three years in terms of the, the use of these job boards. Yes? Going back to the law, is there a penalty for discrimination? Do you know of any lawsuits? I don't. Um, um, so, I, yes, I think uh, that's a good question. Uh, but I, I don't know of any um, in, in exactly how that has played out, or or how or how an individual could prove that they were discriminated against. So we're looking at this in terms of you know having put in over twenty thousand applications. What do we see? What do we find? But if you're one individual applying, like how you would prove? So you basically were showing the existence of this in general, rather than an individual case that would give the, an individual the information they needed to bring a lawsuit. So, so understand the context of the Chinese language is no or low penalty situation. So it's almost like the Chinese language or should we understand it as possible? How should we understand I mean the narrative is clearly English and that it's expensive. Um I would say that uh I'm not an expert in that area in terms of the legal uh so I, I there, there are definitely re clear redress procedures for, for violating provisions of the labor law. So one of these provisions is it's you can labor. initiate a complaint and there's a system where it can go to arbitration or it can go eventually to the court if you want. Um, but I don't but how I you would any prove. data on how often that yeah. occurs or the success rates and what the, what the compensation typically is. For yeah. Well, I was a meeting at Big Off, I think about three years ago, of uh, Chinese lawyers who discussed the possibility of proposing that there be something equivalent to the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission uh, that exists in the United States or something similar to that Hong Kong. As far as I know, uh, their materials were circulated and went up to a high. But didn't did not emerge, yeah. And and in, I, at the very end, on the last slide, I mean, I, I'm going to propose that there are some ways that the amount of discrimination can be fairly easily on in, on internet job boards could be mitigated. So the discrimination about getting that first all important interview. So you you know you're not going to get hired if you don't get interviewed. So I can I'll talk about some sort of simple solutions um, that could be put in place um, uh, on sort of at the end of at, at the end of this. The other evidence on this is the work that Maggie described. That is, you know, just analyzing the content of job ads in China, which are many of them are explicitly discri you know, discriminatory. In terms of yeah, so that only take people with a residence permit from certain areas, or only take women of a certain age, or a certain, certain height, height and things, or be beauty, legal. or um, so. So that was a paper by Kai Ling Shen and Peter Kuhn um, that I think is a really important paper. Um, so, so the, on the resume audit study, there's been a whole lot of papers that have looked, tried to address issues of ethnicity uh, using this methodology. The one that I referred to already by Marianne Bertrand and Melina Thon um, for the USA and their, their fairly famous paper, Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? And that got a lot of attention and there's, you know, they found huge amounts of discrimination. But there are others for Australia, for Canada, for Germany. Most of these ones, but not all of them, conflate immigrant status with ethnicity. And so it's not clear to me that they're always getting at it. But some have tried very carefully to eliminate that difference. 
Um, so some, like the, the third one on the second page, you know, they look at first and second generation immigrants on the one that uh, Monger had, sorry, on the go back one on the bottom, uh, Koss and Monger, they carefully um, controlled for citizenship and being um, native speakers of German and so on. Uh, so there being a number, but often they're sort of conflated with immigrant status. Now that's not the case for the Bertrand and Milana Thane paper. Right? So, so this one for China I think really stands out in that we're really talking about you know, the Chinese population. We're not talking about people who have immigrated. Um, so the basic elements of the design, and this will be similar to the subsequent two, but we basically create a pool of resumes. In this case, it was for 24-year-olds who were single. They were currently employed. They were university-educated women. Um, and they were for six different cities, so for, for Nanjing, Shenzhen, Chengdu, Kunming, Ur Urumqi, and Hohok. Um, and for each location, we created different resumes for women seeking jobs in three occupational categories. These were chosen because we were trying to do this work in the summer while the students were off, so we had a short time frame. And there were lots of openings here uh, and for accountants, admin assistants, and sales reps. And that is basically the reason we chose them, um, because uh, we felt that these were also jobs for which when we registered as if we were a company and we looked at real resumes, lots of women were applying for these and these were, in this particular study, all women that we were using. So each resume was designed to be realistic. We did this by registering as a firm and downloading hundreds of resumes and then essentially borrowing parts of these. They were all from different cities other than cities we're applying in uh, and rebuilding resumes. So we uh, used information that was sort of typical on real resumes uh, that we took from uh, one of the three major job boards. Um, so after they, the resumes were created, just one second, after the re resumes were created, then we randomly assigned the names, being Han, Mongolian, Tibetan, or Uyghur. Um, and then we made four versions of each person's resume where they varied in terms of whether they went to a university in the city where they were currently working and now applying for a new job, um, and whether or not they change jobs often. So we had them change jobs once or twice. And we were trying to think, do firms want people who are ambitious or do they want stability? We're just trying to figure out what characteristics are firms really interested in. You have a question? Uh, do you feel about why firms Um, I don't know. I mean, we were tried to design it in a way if we could get at whether or not it's taste-based discrimination. But partly, you know, sometimes we chose occupations, some that dealt more with customers directly. So we thought accountants aren't dealing directly with customers. Admin assistants are sort of in between. But sales reps are really out there dealing with the public. So we tried to get at that is, you know, what is it? What's behind um, the differences in the callback rates? So we designed that, uh, you know, we, we wanted to have differences in those occupations, not only because there were lots of them, but because there were different degrees of integrate of um, uh, of integration with the public. So, so yeah, we are trying to we are trying to get at that. Um, uh, maybe I should wait, but I just going to ask this now because it's still the point. There was an article in the New York Times just last week, I think, um, one of the people who was from where he said that Asian Americans in the U.S. are doing very well, and is that evidence that there isn't any discrimination against Asian Americans? Uh, and he actually makes the point that he thinks that. It's That, that's, that's uh, I mean, they're competing against other equally educated people in our experiment, but that's, that's not to deny that's a possibility. So before we, I did my very first resume audit study on marital status, 
Oh, I think I actually forgot to turn this on. Oops, okay. Um, uh, sorry about that. Uh, on our very first one, before we did the big one, I had a, an undergraduate student write her thesis who did a pilot project, who did it from Lewiston, Maine. So she got virtual telephone numbers that appeared that they were in China, and she, um, she was working very closely with me, and she uh, did this, also had uh, ethnic minorities, just, or maybe just one ethnic minority, and, but she made them, she was so afraid to, to get enough data to do her thesis that she um, made her, all her candidates superstars. All right, she just wanted to get enough callbacks. She's really nervous about this. And she only put in you know, a few hundred as opposed to us putting in between 16 and 24,000 each summer. So she made her superstar and she made her as all Communist Party members and so on, which I think kind of put like a stamp of approval on their foreheads. And so, you know, it wasn't clear to me that she found anything that would be representative, but it was really, it was a really amazing effort for an undergrad to be able to do a resume audit study from Lewis and Maine. So she had the phones ringing in her dorm sort of lounge area overnight, you know, with, you know, it, it was not apparent to the firms that they were even calling the U.S. Were, they were virtual numbers that she had to, per every, every sort of technical, um, hurdle she ran into, she found a way around. And so, um, in, you know, you in China you wouldn't typically have a voicemail, but all these American phones had a sort of voicemail option if you didn't answer. So she had internet uh, email addresses intercept, and then she had classmates who were from China record mail classmates record the responses. She basically found everything. But I found that the problem was that she had just created applicants that were way above average, whereas we're fine. If, we're trying to find ones that are very typical resume, but I, but I think you know it's a valid point, you know, about whether or not they're changing uh, people's expectations. Um, but in order to try and deal with m employer concern about whether an ethnic minority applicant had a who code that would allow her residence and to work, we designed all the resumes so that, such that each of our applicants had two to three years of work experience in the city uh, for which the position was posted. Um, we you know, had a phone number for each one, we had an email address for each one, um, and we sort of uploaded all of our resumes and had them ready to apply for any suitable openings as they came up. Can I just ask you about what the resume might include? Because my experience in talking to some employers and other Han people in minority areas in China is they often don't have the conception that somebody who's a graduate, even of an elite Chinese university, can properly speak Hanyu. They have the conception that, well, they may have been an academic star and, and did extremely well in such a university, but for some essentialist reason, their grasp of Hanyu must be deficient. And so I was wondering whether when you apply, there's any indication that you give a language ability I mean, it may seem obvious, but for some reason, they have this gap in their thinking. Only in written language. So since they are all presumably writing their own resumes. So, but there's nothing verbal to, you know, um, in terms of, there's nothing that would indicate on paper what their um, oral proficiency is. So yeah, there there is no way to indicate that here, I think. But, and I, I think that is one thing that employers are very concerned about. Um, so, so simple. Uh, here we go. All right. So here's the here's sort of the larger story. Uh, in all, you know, we had a callback rate of just about six and a half percent. So for every hundred applications we put in, we'd have you know six to seven callbacks. Um, here's the uh, sort of rates. The the Han Chinese had a eight point one five percent callback, and it progressively decreased for Mongolians, Uyghurs, and those with Tibetan names. And then we take the ratio of the Han to the Mongolian, or the Han to the Uyghur, or the Han to the Tibetan. And the way you interpret this is that a Mongolian candidate would need to put in 36% more applications than a Han to get the same number of callbacks. A Uyghur candidate would need to put in 83%, and a Tibetan, or 20, 121% more applications to get the same number of callbacks. Remember that they've already demonstrated, our, our fictitious candidates have already demonstrated that they're working in this city, they're university educated, 
um, and so on. So they, they are, they're definitely employable because they've, they've illustrated that by their rates of employment. So these are pretty phenomenal differences. Um, and then I looked at it, well, does it matter where you're located? So these first four uh, rows are showing these callback rates for um, different cities. So the first one, Chengdu, Kunming, Nanjing, and Shenzhen. And you can see the stars indicate that the uh, rate of callbacks is significantly different from the Han. So in a row for Chengdu, you can see that the callback rate is different for the, statistically different for the Mongolians, the Uyghurs, the Tibetans. Uh, in Kunming, uh, the Mongolians and Han have, you know, statistically there's no um, appreciable difference in their callback rates and so on. All right, so these are for four cities, and you can see there's a fair bit of uh, variation, but uh, only in Nanjing are, you know, at least there, there seems to be less uh, differences in the callback except for the Tibetans. If you read down the columns, oops, that's not what I meant to do. If you read down the columns, you'll see, like, there's a star next to the Tibetans in each of the four cities. So in every place, there seems to be a significantly lower callback rate for the Tibetans. So, if you read across the rows, you get the city, and you read down a column, you get the ethnicity. So let me um, just... The difference is in the callback rate. So each of those rates is a mean number of callbacks. So, um, so, so every time we put in an application, we, I, I forgot to mention this, it's important. Uh, every time we applied, we put in two um, applications. So a Han plus one of the minorities. And so we're looking at overall over the course of the summer, what was the difference in the callback rates? But do you have a p-value? And I'm wondering, also, do you get a joint test for all the states, or is it per city, per ethnic? Oh, on the, for all cities together, the differences were significant at um, a rate greater than, you know, smaller than 1%. For these ones, if I remember correctly, it's like 5%. The star meant they were significantly different at 5%. For the overall rates, they're highly significant. And I'll, I'll show you some um, more detailed analysis that goes, it does show the p-values uh, when, I, when I do this. So these are just simply counting and then looking at the differences. But remember, we had two cities that were in my, minority autonomous regions. And here, there were very few job postings. So we don't have the same size, the same number of applications, but there are no statistical differences here. Um, and the callback rates for Pahot are virtually the same. So in the minority areas, we set up the design such that in Pahot, we only applied as Han and Mongolian. So each pair that went in, in, in Urumqi, we only applied as Han and Uyghurs, of course. There were no, um, so we only have about 400 applications of each, and there are no significant differences there. Um, now, so this is, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you're asking about the p-values and so on, this is a, um, this is, you know, uh, I don't know how many people in the audience are economists, but the sort of analysis that economists typically do, uh, where what I have here is a regression, a probit regression run on what is the probability of getting a callback, where we take all of the factors into account at the same time. So we have ethnicity, where the base case is a Han, and what type of a position you're applying for, all the cities, and then whether or not you were in an autonomous uh, minority area, uh, and some of those other job characteristics. Were you locally educated for university, and did you have only one previous job? Now the shading, the sort of tan color means that these are statistically significant, um, and basically everything is significant. All of these things matter. Um, and what was, so, so in terms of not things other than ethnicity, employers really wanted um, people to have a local education, and they want to, they seem to be more interested in stability. So about, so these are, you know, approximately one percentage point higher callbacks, but that's on a six and a half percent, so it's a big jump in the callback rate. So those two characteristics seem to be desirable to the employers in our study, um, and this is sort of interesting. So when you, when you sort of interact being a Hoho and being Mongolian, the difference, the increase, in the callback rate sort of offsets the decrease up here. So these are, you know, there are 2.3% percentage points less likely to get callback. So essentially when you control for being in a minority area, there's no difference in the callbacks for Mongolians and Han. But for in, uh, in 
Urumqi, there's actually quite an advantage to the um, uh, to the Uyghur applicants. Okay. So that's sort of the, the overall. These are the differences from the perspective of the individual. So clearly, there are really significant differences for minority applicants in the number of uh, applications they get. But that led to the question, you know, although an individual gets very different rates of callbacks according to ethnicity, not all firms discriminate. So at the firm level, so we had about, oh, sorry, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere around 12 or 1,300 callbacks out of all the ones we put in over the summer. We put in about 20,000. So we had a certain number of callbacks. Uh, some firms called one candidate, some called just only the Han candidate, some called only the minority, and some firms called both. So we had 944 firms that were making any kind of callback. And uh, so those are the, the rates. He, oops, keep doing this, sorry. Uh, so here are the rates. Um, you know, basically, firms are as likely to call back both candidates as only the Han, and a small number of firms call back only their minority candidates. So I want to say, well, what explains which firm does what? So when we applied for each posted opening, we collected as much information as we could about the firms quickly. So it depended things that you could really read off the job ad. So we were able to look at firm size and firm ownership. Those are the two things we could really collect. Um, so were they privately owned firms? Were they state-owned firms? Were they joint ventures and so on? Um, so what I did next, again, using the kind of analysis that economists are very fond of, uh, I did another uh, probit analysis, but this time it was sort of a multinomial probit to see whether a firm is going to treat both candidates equally. That is, if you make any callbacks at all, do you call back both? Or do you call back only the Han candidate? Or do you call back the uh, minority candidate? And so what determines these things? Um, so uh, this is the only uh, other uh, sort of complicated uh, table that I'm going to put up right now. Uh, so these are the average effects. Um, and again, anything that's in 10 is statistically significant. I'm tripping over my own words here. Um, and you can see, so, so what the first group is, since we, get, we gave a pair of applications to each Firm. They either had a Han and Mongolian, or a Han and Tibetan, or Han and Uyghur. So the base case here, and of this marginal, uh, what I'm showing here is what, what, what determines whether or not firms call back only the Han applicant. I'm not going to go through all the others. They're very, and they give very similar uh, sorts of information. So what determines whether a firm is only going to call back the Han? Well, if they're given the Mongolian. So, these, so what, how we interpret these is simply the difference if you have a Han Tibetan pair compared to a Han Mongolian pair. Um, and you're, you're, more, you're highly, much more likely to call back only the Han if you're given a Han Tibetan pair or a Han, or a Han Uyghur pair compared to a Mongolian um, and Han pair. So what if only the Han applicant had a single previous job? We know that was a desirable characteristic. Well, if only the Han had a single previous job, that's, sorry, that's not even significant. Uh, if only the Han applicant had local education, that really increases the chance that the Han's gonna be get, get the only callback. If the minority applicant had a single previous job, a good qualification, that lowers the chance that only the Han gets a callback, and so on. So if only the minority applicant has local education. So if the minority has the desirable characteristic, it, it means that firms are really reading these resumes and they're deciding what characteristics they care about. All right, and then we have, you know, depending where they're located and so on. If firms are state-owned, they're much less likely to call only the Han. So the, the state-owned firms are actually less likely to discriminate in, in favor of the Han. All right, so and let me just sum up what, what that big complicated table uh, says. Uh, basically, um, if there's a Tibetan candidate in the pair, it, the, the firm is much more likely to call only the Han. If the Han has superior, you know, desirable education, they're more likely to get a callback. If the minority folks have local education or only and more job stability as evidenced by only one previous job at this relatively young age, 
Um, that lowers the chance that a firm will only call the Han, and so on. All right. Now, what are, the what are the things that determine whether or not a firm calls back only the minority candidate? Well, um, ha you know, having a Mongolian helps, but having a Tibetan or Uyghur candidate uh, does not increase the chance of only the minority being called. Um, certain jobs, uh, certain locations, certainly being in Urumqi increases the probability of only the minority getting called. Yes? It was um, a little bit later, two years later. Do you worry about that? Like, that in regards to other people who are, at least, the most little attention? Yes, I do. Um, but we were sort of, um, we need, since the only way to indicate ethnicity was to have names that were clearly non Han, we stuck with this anyways. But I, it's not something. Um, it's not something, you know, I, I think it actually contributes to the reality that people are facing. So, yes, I'm concerned about it, but I think it's part of the reality on the ground. Is it part of discrimination um, It may be a, a contributing factor to the differences in the callback rates, yes. And are these all women? They're all women in this study. And that was simply, and so I think for women, actually the stereotype, stereotype threat is less than for men, and so I think this could be a lower bound of what you would find if you did it for men. And I only did it for women just because that's who my two research assistants were. Um, it's not that it wouldn't have been interesting or even more interesting to do it for men. And then I later found out that that reason was um, uh, sort of an artificial restriction that I put on because Chinese cell phones, you can get the ones that have buttons on them so you sound like a young woman, an older woman, a young man, or an older man. So that's what we did on our finals on our final one that I hope I have time to get to. Um, I'm not sure how, how I'm doing for time. Can somebody tell me how much time I have left? Okay, I need to sort of. Yeah. We can go over a little bit. Okay. Okay, so, um, so this sort of summary of the firm analysis. When firms don't treat candidates equally, the ethnic composition of the pair matters. However, um, the ethnic composition has no effect when firms are treating equally. All right, so I only showed you the situation where they prefer a Han, but it went through all these. And they're all in the paper, which is published, so that it's available. Um, location matters. It really matters. It differs from city to city. Um, and the ownership matters. State-owned state -owned firms are more likely to treat an candidates equally and less likely to discriminate against mi minorities. And the firm size, whether it's a small firm or a large firm, which in the literature on resume studies ought to matter in terms of how much employee interaction there is for employees who are ethnically different, does not show up at all here. All right, so our students were just carrying around a lot of phones. Uh, quick question about the names. Uh, so I, I know that a lot of these minorities are Xuanming, right? And they use the school, and it looks interesting. Um, I don't know how common that is, um, and I, so I'm not sure how it would show up on the job boards. Um, but it's certainly, um, I mean, there are a lot of things that are on people's ID that they would change if they could change. I, I wrote a recent paper using the Rumik data on native place discrimination, so that was looking at our, our migrants from Hunan treated worse in all the places they migrate to than migrants from other places. And so, I, you know, there's a lot of, I sort of cited some of the newspaper clippings at the time that, that Beijing students who were from Hunan were applying to change their place of birth on their Shenzhen so they wouldn't be identified as being from Hunan and be discriminated against. And there were stories of parents in, um, um, Parents in Sichuan scolding their children, you know, saying that you know if they didn't behave themselves, they'd be shipped off to Hunan, and you know, so all, all this kind of stuff. So there are clearly things that people would like to. Are names, are names as, you know, 
strictly enforced as your 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 uh, red, 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 red. Well, but see, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure on the Jabard if you have to use the same name that's on your Shenzhen Gen. So, so even though you may identify in school a certain way, so that that's a good. It would be a good thing to look into. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Uh, I think I think that it may be a lower bound compared well compared to the I, I, I suspect that men would actually face more discrimination than women uh, on ethnicity all right so I, I haven't uh, sort of managed my time too well um, so I wanted to I'm going to skip through some of this uh, second study which is on um, marital status and uh, unemployment status. I'll show you just one slide that sort of talks about the conclusions, and then I want to go on to the study that's on facial attractiveness. Um, so excuse me for a second while I sort of flip through these. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so I'm just going to get to the conclusions. So doing a very similar study, uh, again, with you know uh, more than 16,000 applications, we set it up so they were young women or either 24-year-old women or 30-year-old women. It's done separately, not competing against each other. So 24-year-olds competing against other 24-year-olds and 30-year-olds competing against other 30-year-olds who were married, single, or left unspecified. And then for each of those pairs they were either currently employed or currently unemployed. And if they were currently unemployed, they might have just been out of work for one, two, or three months, or they might have been out for a year or more, or a year, approximately a year. So this, the findings that we, we found on the second study are just summarized here. Um, there appears to be absolutely no evidence of discrimination against employment status for those who are short-term unemployed. Right? So this was something that was of great concern in the US in the depths of the Great Recession, that people who were unemployed were somehow suffering from a stigma of being unemployed and were less and less likely as time went on to get jobs. All right, so we found, just like many other studies for the US and uh, for Switzerland and for Sweden, we found short-term unemployment is not held against candidates. But we found that, and, it, and we found that long-term unemployment was, that you know, once we controlled for all factors, uh, sort of ceteris paribus, that long periods of employment really did reduce women's chances of obtaining job interviews. We found that marital status, there wasn't really anything systematic uh, in terms of whether or not it affected their chances of getting uh, um, a job interview, but we did find there was some slight indication that employers wanted women to conform to social norms. They there was a slight preference for women to be single when they were young and to be married when they were in the 30-year-old age group. All right, so I'll skip over. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the conclusions of that study. But I, I really like to spend a little bit more time on the third study, which is on what, how does facial attractiveness, since in China it is um, necessary in these internet job boards for people to upload a photo. So we wanted to see, and now, now I actually had a male research assistant and I found out that it didn't really matter anyways because phones could disguise people's voices. Um, and so this time we looked at gender and facial attractiveness. So what we did was we did a survey, an online survey. We bought the rights to use photos, um, to use and to alter photos. So we found 36 photos of uh, professionally attired Chinese young people on the um, on the sites like um, bigstock.com, they have like five million photos. You can you know you can buy the rights to these photos. So we found the photos on various sites and collected them. And then we did a survey, and we sent out the survey online. Um, and we had about 600 responses from mainly from China for people in Asia, sort of ranking the attractiveness of 18 young men and 18 young women. Uh, and then we used that to pick a really handsome guy and a beautiful woman and a less handsome guy and a less beautiful woman and use their photos. Now, one of the problems was that these web, these um, stock photo companies do not sell pictures of ugly people. 
right? It does not give her business. So I had to, I had, I wonder if, I had wonderful colleagues at Bates who work in the imaging center who could sort of pixel by pixel slightly alter these. We used the medical literature and the psychological literature about what people find attractive in a face, the symmetry, the averageness, to make some differences in the photo. So then we took one photo for an attractive man and an attractive woman. Um, and so the survey itself, I didn't write up about the survey, but I, I, would, I think it sort of deserves a paper on its own. Um, just in terms of, and we also did the survey uh, in places other than Asia, and we asked people's own ethnicity and response and their age group and their gender, so just seeing how people ranked particular photos was interesting. Generally, there was a lot of agreement on who was attractive and who was not, um, and there was some agreement of um, non-Asians and about one particular woman looking attractive that no Asians found attractive and vice versa. But generally, on most of the photos, there was a lot of agreement. And women ranked people's attractiveness lower than the men did. Uh, so there's, there's sort of interesting things that were going on. So uh, we wanted to see how the sort of the attributes of gender and facial attractiveness uh, varied over occupation. Do, certain, do they matter a lot more as we would expect in certain occupations depending on who the customers or the other employees of the firm are uh, and so on. All right. So there is no um, specific laws I think like there were on ethnicity that come into play here. Um, there, in terms of the related literature, there are two papers that are particularly related. The first uh, is an ISEA working paper that came out of a study about Argentina, where they took photos of real students at a particular university and sort of merged their photos to get these qualities of attractiveness and averageness and symmetry. So they took, they had really high skilled image people um, form composite photos. And then they took the literature on what's the ideal distance, you know, of your, how, what, how far apart your eyes should be and what the distance is from your nose to the top of your lip and these sort of well-known things in the medical psychological literature and they distorted the same picture. So they used the same picture in its sort of most attractive version and then they sort of slightly altered those. Um, and then, you know, they found out that attractive people got more callbacks. But I looked at the pictures they used, which are published, and I think they look like sociopaths, the ugly ones. I mean, I just didn't think it was realistic at all. And I thought I wouldn't hire that person either. They look scary. Um, so I have some issues with this study. The second one is absolutely fascinating. This got a lot of press, um, although the paper was published in 2014. It, it came out in The Economist and a bunch of newspapers around 2010. Um, this was a study done in Israel where photos are not required, but often people submit them. So they were testing attractive women, attractive men. Some had photos, some didn't. You know, some had, some were less attractive, and it got so much press because the attractive women got less interview callbacks. And then the interviewers were actually, I mean, the researchers were really careful to investigate why. So they had lots of information about who read the resumes and were they male or were they female? Was it, was it an HR firm that was supplying candidates? Was it done in house? And they basically went through every explanation. Why would attractive women get fewer candidates where attractive men got a lot more? And they came to their conclusion, I think is why I got so much press, was that, that women in the, so, who, which firms um, penalized women for beauty? It was the firms that did their in-house hiring, they're doing their own hiring, and their conclusion was that women were jealous of having more beautiful women around, and therefore they didn't call them back. All right, so this got a huge amount of press. So these are only two studies that I could find that actually look at um, sort of the role of facial attractiveness. And I mean, the first one, I really thought those pictures were scary. Um, all right, so here are my four candidates after the bottom two were altered, the top two were the winners of our survey, just as is. The only thing we changed on the attractive man was the photo rights that we bought. He, his skin tone looked a little green, so we warmed him up. So these are just, I didn't have the original photo files with me and I took these off the, uh, off of a, a publication, so they're a little bit lower quality than we really used. The other thing is that on the internet job boards, we could only upload a photo of size 300 um, uh, 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 kilobytes. So, so they were really tiny photos. So we had to make the differences obvious. 
In the survey, he had on a pair of really dark glasses, and we found another picture for sale for him. We altered his face. We made his eyes a little asymmetric, his jaw less defined. We made her nose flatter, her skin tone a little bit less, um, uh, a little bit more modeled, and so on. But they were actually fairly subtle changes, um, and these were tiny photos that were being uploaded. So here's our four candidates. We get to meet them. All right, so what was the difference? All right, the first row on this table shows us the callback rates by gender first and then uh, by attractiveness. And in three out of our four occupations, which were software engineers, accountants, administrative assistants, and people in marketing, women got more callbacks than men. And attractive people got 33% more callbacks than the unattractive. As you can imagine, um, you know, and then the second row sort of gives us these uh, interacted. So what if you have an attractive male, attractive female, and so on. And then looking at these ratios. So um, attractive versus unattractive for men, it made a difference. Uh, 20, the unattractive men would have to put in 24% more applications than an attractive man. And for women, of course, as you might expect, um, despite the Israeli study, uh, there was a 41% difference. So if you were unattractive female, you had to put in a lot more applications than did the men. So um, I've, I've, how, does this vi how does this differ by uh, occupation? So the top row has just the gender difference. And as you can imagine, administrative assistance, there was a real gender difference in favor of women. But you see this in both of these. And this is for uh, the software engineers, where there was a preference for men. Uh, when it came to attractiveness versus unattractiveness in each of these occupations, you can see that there's a big difference for admin assistants. So we thought that we might see more of a difference for sales reps, but we didn't. Um, and we thought accountants less of a difference, but again, we don't see that. Uh, we thought that it wouldn't matter so much for accountants. And you know, when you talk casually to some employers here, they had very strong impressions about you know, facial characteristics of who they would want to trust with their money. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, should, I shouldn't say here, I should say in Beijing. But you know, so I sort of expected this to be a much lower number. OK, uh, so overall, I've got in the, in the bottom uh, table, panel here, I've got their callback rates by occupation uh, and gen with gender and attractiveness interacted. So overall, the difference was an unattractive male got a callback rate of 9.92%, attractive female of 14.27. That's overall. Uh, and then you can see the differences as they go across occupations. So the, um, I highlighted in blue the lowest number out of the four, and in sort of orangey color, the highest number. And it's only for software engineers that the attractive male actually gets more a higher callback rate than does the, uh, than do the women. Okay. So isn't that interesting because out of the four occupations in the software engineer, the women can interact with the fewest people and still do the more work? Um, I'm not sure that they interact with fewer than the accountants do, but possibly. But we had picked them. We picked one occupation because it was male-dominated, one because it was female-dominated, and two because they were relatively neutral. So we uh, we had those four occupations deliberately uh, after after registering as. Oops. Caught here. Yeah, some some of that comes into play, but also. Um, uh, some of that does come into play about whether you're facing customers, and some of it was simply registering as a firm and seeing who was applying. So you know, where do, where do you typically get a lot of applications? So yeah, we we're taking we're trying to take all that into account with a limited in order to get a big enough number, we could only pick a certain number of applications. And again, this was a, a, a study that where all the applications had to be applied and callbacks <coughs> answered in just a couple of months. So you know, once again, um, one table was the uh, that, um, this is from the individual perspective, uh, what things matter here in terms of what helps you get a callback. Um, so which, you know, th these things that are uh, highlighted in bold print are the significant ones. But here, just looking at in these, so the base case was an attractive male. Um, attractive females got, you know, about a 2%. Now this, this callback rate this year 
which was 2012, the callback rate was over 11%. So, but you could get a, you know, almost a two percentage point increase, attractive female, uh, you get a lower, take Ketter's parrots taking all of these things into account, unattractive males um, were penalized as were unattractive females. Um, foreign firms tended to have lower callbacks and so on. All right, so that was, you know, we, and we had interesting sort of, I got an interesting summary from my students. I asked them to give me sort of weekly reports on what the employers were saying when they called them. And Bojian told me, you know, he got um, a text message or an email message from one of the HR managers when he applied as if he were a female software engineer. And the text message came back saying, to have a woman apply is rare indeed, but to have one as beautiful as you is as rare as a panda. <laughs> All right, hence the title of the paper, As Rare as Panda. Um, okay, so, and in sort of concluding this one, um, in Chinese labor markets, women are preferred, at least in obtaining those all important interview callbacks for both gender neutral and female dominated occupations. Attractiveness uh, uh, appears to be a plus for young professionals in China, because remember, these are all college educated individuals who are applying for jobs that require college education, and that seems to hold across occupations, location, and gender. Um, and the Chinese internet job board system is, is really doesn't ask for a lot of information about individuals um, in, terms, you know, in terms of their personal information. Um, and it's, it would be relatively simple to eliminate you know, and use a numbered system, if you eliminated name or gender or photo, it could really be used to move the system to uh, more anonymity and a more level playing field. You know, so I think that if this were sort of recognized that there were discrimination uh, on these features, it would, be, it would be a pretty easy solution in terms of the internet job boards, which are becoming more and more important. So I think policy-wise. In ours, with only four occupations, it was four women. Women were preferred. They got a higher callback rate in three out of the four application of uh, three out of the four occupations, in everything except the software engineers. So, so given that women's wages are increasing with respect to male wages, can you rule out? Um, they're, n they're not discriminated against in getting these yeah. interviews, right? We don't know from this who gets hired, sure. and we don't know if they get hired at a lower starting salary. But there's no evidence against this. The interesting thing, so I only showed you know, the, the, the two on facial attractiveness, but there have been a lot of audit studies on gender, and almost all of them have found the same sort of thing. When you have these internet job boards or these uh, resume audit studies, that women in sort of gender neutral occupations, or even slightly male biased ones, slightly biased ones, um, actually do really well on these resume audit studies. And so for, for different countries, this has actually been a pretty common finding. Uh, surprising to many of the researchers that women seem to be getting higher callbacks. And I, and I think, you know, that's kind of... But yet they don't interpret, they interpret that as discrimination against men, or do they? Or should we think about this as discrimination against men? Yeah, you could, because you, you can think about the discrimination in favor of or against. So it, you know, so it appears that, that men are disfavored on a lot of these occupations. Now, the, the study that I mentioned in terms of ethnicity that was done in Australia by Booth and Lay, that used um, female dominated jobs and they found no, but they put in male applications and female applications, and they didn't really find any effect until the job was one that they perceived as being 80% female dominated. So there have been a number of studies in a number of countries that have, you know, they, they, in Australia, they didn't really find a preference for women until it was really typically a female job, which maybe, you know, for the U.S. might be, say, nursing or something like that. 
Um, but other studies have found ones, you know, they were using jobs that were pretty much neutral, and they, and they did find a preference for women. So I, I kind of, yeah, so I, I think there can be discrimination for or against uh, any kind of category. thought that there was a prejudice against hiring women in China. And I based that on my experience taking students from an American college to do a semester program in China repeatedly. And the first four times I did that, I've actually done it five times, um, the first four times we were based in Nanjing. And so we had a lot of interaction with uh, graduating students, Nanjing University students. Um, and it turned out, so in the, and we, we had Nanjing University professors teaching Chinese star students. I taught a course on Chinese economy. My colleague was teaching one on self and society and Chinese literature. And what we observed repeatedly was that the graduating students didn't get hired, the female students didn't get hired until all the guys were hired. No matter how hopeless those guys were, basically they all got a job offer before the women. So this was really surprising to me. And then when I, you know, sometimes we do these sort of environmental protection short terms and I would talk to a professor of environmental science who was really opinionated and um, just an old salt. You know, I talked to him and he'd say, you know, like, why would I hire a woman? You know, she's going to go off on a maternity leave, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm going to have to, you know, cover all these expenses and you know, hold the job. You know, of course I'll hire a guy first. And he was just really forthright, you know. He would, you know, he had, he would articulate his opinions about, um, uh, you know what officials were saying, uh, you know, in very crude and rude ways, and um, and I just really love this guy. But anyway, so and I, I, so my opinion was sort of colored by all those experiences. So I was really surprised to find that women were getting um, callback rates that were higher. I was quite surprised. Isn't it really important to make a distinction between a callback? No, but you get your chance to represent yourself in your best possible way when you get an interview. If you don't get an interview, you don't get that chance. So you get to present your employability if you get an interview, and then it doesn't mean that you're going to get the job, but at least you get a chance to show that. We're assuming that the minute they actually get to talk to you, all the prejudices are going to fall away, and then you're actually going to be able to... No, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you have a better chance if you get an interview than if you don't get an interview. So it doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the people will drop all prejudice, but but actually it's expensive. You know, so people are getting hundreds of applications on these job boards, 
Um, and so I talked to people, friends who are running businesses in China. So they're, you know, they're getting hundreds of applications. And when they begin to call back, there's lots of people that don't, um, aren't even interested in taking the interview for various reasons. It could be a different part of the city that they want to work in. They might have done it on a sort of uh, robocall application process and they didn't even know anything about your firm and they're not the least bit interested. And so there's all, there's all kinds of things on both sides of the story. But for employers, they, they go through the resumes quite quickly. I'm convinced they're really reading them they're, and then making callbacks in a rational way. But then, you know, to then take the time to interview is a significant um, investment of time, energy, resources. So I don't think that they're doing it, you know, like a dating mechanism or something, you know. So I, I really don't. I really think that these are, you know, sometimes they're HR managers, you know, and I really don't think they're just trying to bring in attractive women. Um, I, I do think that it's a real resource to commit to an interview and it takes, you know, it's very different than simply scanning through the resumes, which can be done 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, but I think once you do that, you're investing real resources of your firm and bringing them in. So I, I so the, that's in China, China's a big enough place that there can always be characters doing what you suggested, but I wouldn't think of it as the norm. Um, I, I tried. I really thought it would be important to know uh, who was reading the resumes. And so on the very first year, I tried to get my research assistants to ask, and it turned out to be just way too awkward. Um, it was not something that the people who were making the phone calls were used to getting. Like, they asked, ask, did you, did you read the resume, or did, were you just, are you just assigned to call back and make appointments for interviews? You know, it, it didn't work. I actually wanted to do that. And, um, you know, in our short time frame and stuff, we, we didn't find it was possible, but I thought it was important to know, and especially on the ethnic minority one, it would have been really important to know the ethnicity of the person reading the, the resume, but it wasn't something that I could actually carry off. You know, it was, it was something we considered, um, but we couldn't do it with the limited, you know, uh, number of people we had working on the project and the time we had to do it. Um, I think the, the, there are things that you could do to gather more information on a bigger project. These, you know, these were working with two undergraduates each and you know, trying to get this done in the summer. And I think that with more time and more resources, you could explore a lot of these important factors in a more thorough way um, than I was able to do in those short time periods. So you can provide more information than is required on these interviews, or you can only fill out the fixed field and not oh, but, no, no, but there's a, there's one where you can fill in personal information about yourself. So, so it's, open, it's open or you can attach a resume? Can you upload a, an actual resume? No, you can't upload the resume. You up, upload the parts of the resume. And so you, you build a resume, but you up, upload it part by part. You don't uh, upload the whole thing. So you go into their categories. There's prescribed categories. But one of the categories allows you to, and in the first year, you know, copying from real resumes, we did put in personal characters Characteristics that we thought were equivalent to each other. Um, so we, you know, in terms of hobbies and life skills and stuff that aren't on the top part. So we, we did that the first year, and for you reasons. You really use that as an opportunity. I mean, if you had uh, hypotheses about what accounts for statistical discrimination, what they're assuming, like language ability or, um, or the quality of ability, and then uh, do some resumes where you don't have any information that's omitted, but then others where you actually say something that really strongly signals you have very good online and really like you want some um, speech content. I mean, things that would then test whether discrimination differs conditional on different types of information that fill in the different omitted variables that you hypothesize. So, so at the IZA Renman um, workshop, there was a person in the audience, He um, Haoren, at the uh, Da who is doing a resume audit study on single children versus uh, those who have siblings. So in, his, in the personal part, he's saying, as the only child in my family, I've, I've you know, learned to be responsible for this or this, you know, and, and, then, you know, and then some other kind of language. I'm not sure exactly what. I'm actually going to go and, and, uh, and talk to him 
in the next week or two uh, back in Beijing. But uh, yeah, so he's trying to use that. And um, uh, I didn't hear exactly why, but Corrado and others were saying he just presented this in Leon and they just tore him apart for it. So I'm not, I'm not sure, entirely sure what he did, but I know that he is really interested in trying to see whether employers are interested in hiring singletons versus those with siblings. Um, and so, yeah, so he's using that section to supply that kind of information, but they didn't like the way that he did it, apparently. Um, and I'm not sure what all was behind it. If you return to the ethnic based study that you did, um, the, the question was raised earlier about if there's discrimination found with respect to at least some of the cities, why might that discrimination take place? And if, if you look at some interview data that I've seen from the US, employers who discriminate sometimes say that they discriminate because uh, they regard minority people as being problematic in one sense, which is that if they want to, for example, dismiss that minority person, then they might be, oh, they might open themselves up to a charge of discrimination. Yeah. So this is a kind of excuse that they use, but in, in, at any rate, it may be believed excuse. Um, in the case of China, it strikes me that one possibility is that if you're looking at Uyghurs and Tibetans, that there's a kind of transaction cost attached to hiring a Uyghur or a Tibetan, which is that the security forces, the Gongangji, the Ministry of Public Security, are very interested in Uyghurs and Tibetans. That is, they pay a lot of attention to what they might be doing and employers may think, well, this makes Uyghurs and Tibetans problematic. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure which way, uh, which would be a method to, to find out about that. And, you, and I would, I would think, but I'm not sure that this is much more likely to be the case for Uyghur or Tibetan men than women. So, so, so it was accidentally just because my research assistants were women, um, but we did it for women only and found these extraordinary differences in callback rates. So, and I, 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 don't, I haven't heard in any of this sort of unrest that women were play, playing key roles. So I don't know to what extent women candidates or women employees come under that same kind of a scrutiny. 